Good night, Blitz. Night. Well, I sure hope somebody picks up that phone. Do what? Because I f***ing called it! Alright folks, what revelation should we start with? Blitz cutting himself out of his own photos? Stolz' wife moved out of the house? Or how Blitz is wearing his dead mother's necklace? Perhaps all three. <laughs> Why not? Tall order, but anything for you shipping degenerates. Now, we've come a long way in this first year of Hell the Boss. I went from hating this ship with a passion to loving it almost unconditionally. Making this latest episode a gut punch. As I watched all the hopes and love from the last episode, get slapped around by reality as these two screw themselves and each other over. Cause they are their own worst enemies. This was a mistake. All right, let's just, let's just leave. This whole contractual fucking began when this horny owl decided he wanted this booty and trade him a magical book for said booty once a month. In that time, Stolz has gone from only in it to hit it to a flustered mess waiting for him to call, while Blitz went from saying this is just a deal to crying that it's just a deal. These two caught feelings, everyone knows it, but as if just to spite me, my hopes and dreams got hit by a bus labeled consequences. My bird boy my Owl King, you done fucked up. This is the mood this episode sets for him and it starts strong. He's one of the big revelations this episode starts with is just how miserable Stolz's life has become. His wife has seemingly moved out of the house, Octavia is with her, leaving the man to just lay around the house watching soap operas. Like this is depressing. Depressing. Stolas, who's usually just like the dramatic and energetic guy, is just alone eating cereal for dinner. And which, yes, this is 100% his fault. The man cheated on his wife in their bed multiple times, even once in front of their friends. Stella has every reason to leave him. This was probably an arranged marriage, so there was never too much love between them. But they didn't full-blown hate each other until she caught in bed with another man, and even worse, with an imp, or basically hell's oppressed demon class. The nobles here are all about prestige and appearances, so for this to happen, it's not just my husband is cheating on me. It's an insult to her honor. It's an insult to her family's honor. And this will be the thing her peers snicker at behind her back for decades to come. So kind of good for Stella for moving out. She's still trying to kill him, but I think the moving out's the more rational of the two options. And I love Stolas. The man is a treat. But he is absolutely a spoiled rich kid, not used to suffering the consequences for his actions. And these are the consequences. Trapped alone in a big empty house, miserable, locked up in your own head, wondering, was it worth it? Was Blitz worth it? Hey, why won't you love me, Alejandro? That's a mood, Gabriella. <laughs> Which yeah, Stolas kinda doesn't know. He, the man started dating Blitz as a deal, but he wants more. He loves Blitz, but doesn't understand how difficult he's made this shit by making it all physical all the time. Creating this expectation that with benefits is all they'll ever be. When Stolas saved Blitz's ass from humans, yeah, it was cute, it was tender for five seconds. But then they left to go screw, which yeah, fun, you do you. But that only contributes to making that problem worse because they're not talking emotionally. It's always about physical gratification, which is why Stolas was so happy when Blitz called, unprompted, out of nowhere, as far as he's concerned. And when Blitz asked him for a date, he just goes gaga. He's in his head, he's thinking, he feels the same way. I'm not putting in all the work to make things happen. He's finally starting to love me like a boyfriend. Blitz, what are you looking at? I'm looking at nothing. How about that? Yeah, this wasn't a real date though, which rough for him and was very painful to watch. Stolas gets so excited and so eager to go on this thing, only for him to show up and be completely ignored. And what makes this suck is that we're not seeing calm, in control, lusting Stolas, but we're seeing this desperate and kind of awkward Stolas. Like the man thinks this is it, their first real date, and it's nothing. He was just a tool to get past the door, which hurts because if you want this ship to work, you care about Stolas, you care about about Blitz. You've seen how Stolas feels like he's in a corner with his wife and child gone. 
Blitz is kind of all he has, and he isn't even confident in that. Because he also believes that they are kind of in a physical only relationship. He doesn't reach out to Blitz and say, hey, you want to hang out or hey, you want to go to this restaurant. He feels like he can't. So to have Blitz reach out to him and say, hey, maybe it's okay for us to take this to the next level. That's music to his ears. That's what he loves. That's what he wants right now. And this was basically a dream scenario, only for it to turn into every shipper's nightmare when it starts to feel like an actual date. How did you kill them? How? I, I mean, there was a lot of them, so I don't know, bullets? Right, right. Yeah, reality's a bitch. The situation, awkward. Stolz is trying so hard to make things go right, while Blitz, he isn't trying. Like, I honestly don't think Bird Boy has been on many dates. And I think that relatability is just what makes it so painful. As I think we've all had that moment where we're just so excited for something, but it doesn't go the way we want it to. Or when you meet someone, and they clearly aren't as interested in you as you are in them. And in this whole dinner scene, we get one moment where Stolz tries to get real and asks Blitz, what changed? Why did you ask me out tonight? And so honest and earnest, I'm just like, oh my god, this is happening. They're actually talking about their feelings. Y you know, you have really nice eyes, daddy. Okay, let's talk about Blitz. Blitz is kind of a train wreck. Not just in general, but this episode especially. As at the start, we see Blitz being his normal self, thriving at work with the happy murder work surrogate family he's painstakingly put together. Because this is where Blitz thrives. When he's killing people, he's close to people, and he's not making things awkward by trying to insert himself into their lives. So of course he tries to insert himself into their lives by suggesting they all go get drinks afterwards. Which yeah, that's cool, that's fine. No sus behavior there. Then Moxie says, oh no no, sorry. Maybe another time, super cool, it's all good. I'm actually taking my wife to our one year anniversary, which Blitz immediately invites himself to. And no, it's not in that, oh, when are we gonna go kind of way that implies he's oblivious to the fact that he isn't supposed to join them. But what he does, which is just classic Blitz, is that he does it in this mocking way where he's making fun of them, he makes fun of the dinner, calls it dumb, calls it boring, talking down to them, when really that's when you know Blitz cares the most. It's when he's being demeaning like that, where he doesn't want to let on how much he cares. And the M&Ms have always been a special thing to Blitz. At first, it's kind of a joke that Blitz would film them outside their room or watch Moxie in his sleep. The exact why he's like this has never been explicitly stated, but I think this episode goes a long way to confirm it. I think the reason Blitz is obsessed with the M&Ms is that he craves intimacy. He wants to be in that kind of relationship. He wants to be in the relationship that they have. He wants to be in the kind of relationship that they have. One without fighting or lies or this theme of conditional love that seems to be a thing in all of Blitz's old relationships. The M&Ms love each other unconditionally. It's boring to him, yes, but it's wholesome and sweet. Blitz wants something like that this. His stocking of the M&Ms has been his way of vicariously experiencing it. This isn't some weird proud dad thing filming his kids. Blitz wants to experience this with them. He fantasizes about having three ways. He, is, he can't even imagine himself having his own Moxie or Millie, so he's parasitically attached himself to their relationship just so he can get a sense of what it's like to be loved. Blitz wants to be loved but lashes out at anyone who gets too close, mocking everything around him because that's the only way he can function. He's insecure and scared of getting hurt, so playing the jaded asshole is the only way he can make it through the day. He's opening up and being honest would open up all the old scars he's been desperately trying to avoid. I think Blitz is an asshole for using Stolas to get into the club and to stalk the M&Ms. But I understand why he's doing this, as he gets this tunnel vision not understanding how he affects other people. That's how he self imploded and ruined his relationship with Roska. That's how he alienated Moxie when his bromance with Stryker started. This is a trait he and Stolas share. It gets them to do things that they wouldn't do if they thought about the consequences more. But here they are, two dumpster fires at a club with people they don't want to see. Did he just sales Oh no fucking way. For those of you playing the 
I haven't read the wiki phase. Here's why Osmodius is a big deal. Within Hell's hierarchy, we have Lucifer at the top, the Seven Deadly Sins, an unknown group of demons that Osmodius most likely belongs to, as he is the ruler of the Ring of Lust, one of the seven layers of Hell where all of its denizens reside, with the next tier down being the Osgoetia, where Stolas sits. Not at the top of the food chain, but he's effectively Hell nobility, with even powerful overlords like Alistair from Has Been Hotel being beneath him in status. This is important because while Stolas doesn't care to be seen with Blitz around lesser demons, like the bouncer at the club or the imps in Wrath, Osmodius is more Stolas's peer. These two have met before. They probably go to all the same fancy parties. And while the gossip from imps and tabloids can be dismissed with the power of money, if Osmodius tells you that shit, no one is gonna risk death to correct him. If Stolas had shut the f*** up money, Osmodius has no you shut the f*** up money. So naturally, he's very nervous to be spotted with Blitz, which betrays a level of insecurity on Stolas's part, because he loves Blitz. I don't doubt that. But dismissing your wife's opinion is one thing, but Osmodius's would open the floodgates for all of hell giving their two cents, which might lead to them discovering the book he's been loaning to Blitz, which is a whole nother thing. Like, this is the shit I talk about when I say this whole episode threw a wrench into the smooth sailing from last episode, and somehow making it even worse because now we know that they care about each other. But the love is now hitting some obstacles, as yeah, it's fine to save your boyfriend when no one's watching, but to stand by him when you have a lot to lose is something else entirely. This pretty much confirmed my theory that Stolas' identity is so tied to his family and his prestige, it's what he's been raised to value, it's just so ingrained in him that Dane Imp goes against those principles, but he is also very much attracted because of it. Which reminds me. Bloody Mary, full of vodka, blessed are you among cocktails. Pray for me now, and at the hour of my death, which I hope is soon. Amen. Let's talk about the song. So after Moxie tries to give a small romantic ballad to his wife, Fizz and Osmodius gives him shit for keeping it PG, because they want that hardcore. Which, to be fair, this is the lust ring in a club people pay money to have sex things happen. It's cute, but it is not the vibe. So the King of Lust sings about lust, talking down to the M&Ms, and the man who's obsessed with its value steps up to defend them. Because yeah, he's trying to be a good friend here in his own messed up way. Honestly, they make missionary look relatively exciting. I saw you looking at your boyfriend for validation. You can't hide that from me. But it's here where that shit hits the fan. With Fizz calling out Blitz for daring to talk about relationships, they've apparently known each other since they were young and also may be related based on the matching skull markings. So I guess that all tracks. Then Veraska starts singing. A reckless heartbreak. And Verasica, sex goddess that she is, rips into Blitz, being taken no give, which... Okay, so another hot take. Verasica is a bitch, but she's not at fault for the breakup. By all accounts, Blitz was awful to her. Someone else to pay for the hotel room, steal their car and run, run three, three rings to rap, rap and max, and max my credit cards on, on shitty, shitty horse, horse riding, riding lessons. lessons. God damn it, whore, you will not let that go. Check out my buddy Charles's video on the subject. One subtle thing though that I love was when at the end, Veraska calls him a heartbreaking thief. She leans in, practically spitting the word. Blitz, having spent all of his time dismissing her, like, oh, it's that crazy chick again. Stolas is just deeply shocked at all this. Blitz has been playing it off, like he doesn't care about her or what she says. But when she gets in close, his mask crumbles, and he just has this, I don't even want to call it a pained look. Like, this isn't fun insults anymore. I've hurt this person. Oh my god, what have I done? And I think this is the trap Blitz has fallen into in the past. He doesn't just believe he needs to push people away to protect himself, but he also thinks that he makes people worse by being with them. Even in his own house, we see photos all over the wall, but he's marked himself out of all of them. Like, they're better off without him. Like, he's the problem in this picture, and would rather see their smiling faces than his own. Blitz's self-worth is non-existent. He talks a mean game, but he's a wreck in need of help, but only ends up slapping away anyone who would try and save him. Which brings us to the moment I called way back in my first video on the subject. As post-roasting Blitz, Osmodius recognizes Stolas. At your table. 
Is your data demon Prince? Stoic, is that you? Calling him out for being there with Blitz so the rest of the neck breathers chime in. Are you sleeping with an amp? Woo! Oh, fuck you, Wally. Here the sub gets gets put into text. Stolas thinks he's lost his wife and daughter to pursue Blitz. He's getting mocked by his peers. And when he's called out, when he's given the chance to stand by Blitz. For a thrust! Now that's the spirit of the Lord. Yeah, Stolas buckled. The man who most visibly wanted to be more than friends couldn't stand up to the crowd and say he was with him. Like, damn, that hurt. It was shitty, and all the self-worth and self-hate issues that Blitz has and has been dealing with just got validated. Because he was letting Stolas into his life. Sure, the reason he called Stolas to this date was that he needs someone else to get into the building. We also called Stolas because he thought, just physical, it doesn't really matter, I can't get hurt by this. Then this happened, and validates all the bad things he's been saying about himself and about Stolas. What we have is anything but you wanting me to fuck you, okay? You make that really clear all the time. And one moment that I really love is when Stolas brings up that this is their first date. He has this weird confused look, like he doesn't hate that Stolas calls it that, but he's not fully into the idea either. Blitz is still trying to sort out his own feelings, kind of like Stolas, but I think he does like him. He wouldn't be looking to him for validation if he didn't, or look at him in awe when he saved his life. But for Stolas to hide his face, Blitz takes that as confirmation, that he is ashamed of him and that they only have this physical relationship that what he might have felt for him was wrong, that he is this unlovable, miserable person who ruins things. Like, there's a lot more to this scene than that. Like, Stolas hiding his face might be more of a gut reaction to facing Osmodius. Like, awful thing to do. But Stolas is just as much ashamed of himself and embarrassed as being embarrassed to be with Blitz. He isn't just straight shunning the dude. Because as soon as the attention is back on the M&Ms, Stolas tries to reach out and comfort Blitz, recognizing that yes, this man is in pain and he needs someone, but it's already too late. He's too emotionally raw, and he just decides to leave. Which I think is totally fair given the circumstances. If my date did this to me, I'd already be gone. But then we move to the car scene, and I think the hardest thing about this, or besides the fact that Stolas needed a ride home, Blitz isn't yelling, he isn't mocking, he's just so tired and trying not to cry. Stolas turning away wasn't some great shock, it just confirmed all of Blitz's worst thoughts. So to have Stolas leaning in through the window trying to show him that he does care to salvage this night is just too much for him. He can't go through the motions or pretend to be anything more than what he thinks Stolas wants, which is just a sex friend. You make that really clear all the time. But I just, I, I can't do it tonight, okay? But for Stolas, this isn't about sex or deals. He's trying to make up for what he did and to help someone he cares about. Stolas just doesn't know how to say that or to make up for what he did other than try to make things sound casual or address, I am so fucking sorry for what I did to you. That was not okay. Talk or watch a movie or maybe cuddle. God, these two both need so much therapy. It breaks my heart to see Stolas try so hard to make this a real relationship. Blitz thinks he just wants to bang him. He won't allow himself to believe that he could be anything more than his impish little plaything. So he returns to his MO of pushing people away, insisting that with Stolas, it's all physical. Just, I, I can't do it tonight, okay? I'm sorry. And that was the line that broke me. Now, if he didn't care, he wouldn't have thrown in that sorry. If he didn't like Stolas, he wouldn't have driven him home. Blitz cares. There's so much else going on here between them that it's hard for this ship to actually work. They're comfortable lusting after each other, but being open is a challenge they just can't handle yet. Stolas tries, but his wealth and actions alienate Blitz, making him think that this can't work that all of his pet names are just his way of patronizing him. But I also love how in this one moment, Stolas calls him Blitz. Good night, Blitz. Night. Now, I don't think this is the end of the ship. And for as sad as these scenes were, I'm also perversely happy that they happened. Because the other nobles, Blitz's insecurities, these issues have been there since the start. This is not a super new development. If they want to be together, this is the shit they got to work through. And I'm happy that it's happening now rather than holding off for four seasons only for it to get hand waved in one. I'm happy with this episode because it allows us to explore the dysfunctional dynamic that makes Stolas so entertaining. 
remaining. Will they be able to reconcile in the finale? Will they return to the status quo? Or will they start dating in one big climactic kiss? I don't know, but I'm invested and want to see how this ends. Because we don't have all the pieces yet. We still aren't sure what caused Blitz to become this person who is so focused on family and love, yet unable to create those genuine bonds. You just know that it's all gotta be tied to his mother. He wouldn't be wearing her choker if it wasn't important to the backstory. Maybe we'll find out why he has that giant white mark on his face, and is it a scar? But the one tidbit that I want to leave off on is how when Blitz came home, before he cried himself to sleep, he tried to go to Luna, who is the one person in his life he tries to love. But she's outliving her own life. Love and family are everything to Blitz, probably because something broke his. Maybe he's been trying to replace that all his life, but we don't know the answer yet. But honestly, I can't wait to find out and to see what happens to these two. But that's it for now. Can't wait for the next episode. Not sure how deep they're gonna go into this one, but hey, definitely gonna be more shipping. 